my name is Samantha Riles from Sugar Research Australia and I'd like to welcome you, welcome you to our third Milling Regional Research Seminar for 2020. Today we have two speakers. Professor Ross Broadfoot from Queensland University of Technology will be presenting on pan design and opera operational changes to suit Australian pan stages operating on low pressure vapour. Our second speaker is Dr. Ayman Ashtani from Queensland University of Technology, who will be presenting on performance of the SRI fixed element cooling crystallizer at Broadwater Mill. Please note that today's webinar is being recorded and a copy of it and the slides will be sent to all registrants. Throughout the presentation, all attendees will be on mute. If you are having any technology issues, please send a message in the chat box which is located on the menu bar of your webinar screen. If you experience any issues in hearing the sound coming from your computer, please feel free to join by phone and I will put this number in the chat box. I will be assisting as a co-host to ensure all runs smoothly. We encourage you to take an active part in today's webinar by asking questions. As this webinar is in listen-only mode, you can do this at any time throughout the webinar by typing your question into the Q&A button on the menu bar. At the end of each presentation, there will be an opportunity for Ross and Iman to answer those questions. If it is easier for you, for you to ask your question verbally than to type in the Q&A, please use the hands up button also on the menu bar. I will then be able to unmute your microphone. As I moderate the questions, I will let you know who is asking the question. If you prefer to stay anonymous, there is a box you can check to remain anonymous. Our attendees from today include staff from these milling companies, Wilmar, Sunshine Sugar, Mackay Sugar, Bundaberg Sugar and MSF Sugar. I'd now like to hand over to our first presenter for today, Ross. Thank you. Okay, well, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for coming into uh, to the seminar. Um, before we start, I'd just like to introduce my uh, co-author on this topic, uh, Aman. He joined us last April as one of our capability uh, partially funded by QUT, SRA uh, and S SRI. So Aman will be doing the second talk and he's been working with me on various process projects last year. And uh, he's the man doing all the legwork at the moment in analysing the data from this project. So as you can see the title there, as Samantha said, we're looking at the pan design and operational changes that are needed to suit Australian pan stages if we wish to operate on low pressure vapour. So uh, the objectives, pretty simply to determine the most appropriate changes to the Australian pan stages to enable effective operation on low pressure vapour such as we're talking here about 80 to 90 kPa absolute. Um, for interest, 80 kPa absolute is about 93 degrees C saturation temperature. Uh, 90 is about 90, 90 kPa is about um, 96, 97. And uh, as you probably know, or would know, most of our pan stages run with about 200 kPa absolute or 120 degrees C. And we've got a couple that are running down as low as uh, 150, so that's about 111 degrees C. So even from our lowest 111, we're talking about a substantial drop in that saturation vapour temperature that we're aiming to achieve or work out how we can get our pan stages to still run well. So uh, as an aim, we want to determine the changes to minimise the required capital investment while really maintaining all our KPIs. So throughput, uh, our recovery, and also still maintain good quality sugar. So it's a fair task. Um, I, guess if, I guess some of you might be saying, well, why is it so important to get down to this low pressure vapour? And uh, I guess currently we're, we're not sitting in a situation where that's important, but what we're aiming to do is to get ready for that situation, which hopefully 
uh, will arise of, as our industry gets a good opportunity down the track, and hopefully soon also, where we can diversify, get, get an additional revenue stream, uh, in which case we may need then to get surplus per gas so we can either generate more power, um, use that per gas for say an animal feed or production of chemicals. So that's the aim is to sort of see what, what are we going to do on the pan stage so we could run with low pressure vapour to suit this, um, this future position. Uh, to give you an idea of what the, the changes would be for a 500 ton hour factory, um, so currently running on vapour one, such as our, what we call our cogen factories at the moment, where they're using extensive vapour bleed for heaters um, and mostly on vapour one for pans. If they were to knock that vapour down to vapour three for the pan stage, the steam percent cone would go from about 40 at the moment down to 34. So it is a very substantial reduction just, just by that change. I'm say just by the change, it is fairly difficult. Um, making that six unit drop, we could generate another 3.4 megawatts, or we estimate about 36,000 tonne of surplus per gas, which could go to animal feed or or what other uses it may be for. So a fair bit of extra revenue comes as a result of that, uh, that change. So the project's really about sort of trying to see what changes we should be really aware of anyhow, so that those factories interested, they can incorporate those so they're in a good position should these uh, opportunities arise for diversification. So uh, the phases of the project, they're all listed here. First one here is really to get good data from uh, our existing factory pans. And that's for two reasons. One is to sort of get a better idea of what our limitations are at the moment in terms of our um, minimum vapour pressure we can safely run with. And obviously this is going to depend on pans and, and the duty, but different designs of pans around the industry. But the other important part is we need to get a, a good handle on the HTC as a function of the various process parameters and we've listed the main ones we see here vacuum boiling point height or boiling, sorry boiling height so the height above the calandria steam rate and the viscosity of the mass group. and we need that reliable HTC correlation so we can then use it in the next two stages of the, uh, looking at control using the dynamic model of syscad um, which we've already done some work on that in the previous product, you may recall. But we really need to be able to bring in the HTC information so we can sort of limiting our steam rates accordingly as we change the process conditions. Uh, the other phase we will use this is in our pan stage flow scheme steady state model using SISCAD. Um, this may be where we need to change our flow scheme to suit low pressure vapor. It could be a CBA scheme or it could be. Um, could be say uh, separation of your molasses from your beef fugals or whatever. It could even be dropping pans a bit lighter uh, and suffering a, a bit of a consequence there on, on exhaustion or maybe some, making some adjustments so we can recover that. So the next two stages and they all rely on getting this good HTC correlation. And the last stage within this project is uh, Dave Moller's doing a PhD thesis on uh, CFD modelling and again looking at with all the new techniques available today, better software, learning more about circulation in pans and how we may be able to improve our pan designs. Because obviously if we can get the circulation better, it just naturally transposes to we can run with a lower pressure vapour, um, lower calandria pressure, lower pressure vapour and obviously everything will proceed better. And of course, then at the end, we bring all these recommendations uh, together for, uh, for the mills to um, based on this work. That's what the project's about. Um, so our primary focus to now, that's 2018 and 2019 seasons, is to, be, to get a lot of good data around the industry. So we looked at 14 batch pans, uh, two continuous pans, and seven factories in total. We, we gathered this data. Uh, we looked at every boiling duty, so C seed, magma, A, B, and C masquets, a couple of stirred pans in there. Uh, so, what we did is we, we basically got log data from the factory, but we, we went to each of these sites 
If the cell runs on each pan, sample the masquerade, got a separated molasses sample and wood sample, and that was obviously analysed uh, QUT. So this gives us information on the, I guess, the viscosity of the masquerade, the heaviness of the masquerade, and well, that'll be coming into our HCC correlation. So typically we would get about four samples per, per cycle, tracking you through from putting through to uh, pan full and where we could, a dropping sample as well. Um, we always cross-check the Calandria pressure transducer that the factory had installed uh, with our own machine, our own transducer. That was obviously an important parameter. And, uh, and then analyze, then obviously we're analyzing the data, we're still in the process of this, uh, looking at things like boron rates and obviously HTC. And where we could, we, were, we looked to try and get information on the impact of changing the headspace pressure, uh, steam rates, and whether a stirrer was fitted, changing the speed of the stirrer. See what influence that had on calandria pressure, and obviously also on uh, HTC. So as I say, the main thing is bring all this data together now to uh, give us a reliable HTC correlation. I guess lurking in this whole project is the fact that we weren't able to um, cross check the steam rates to, that were measured by the factories. Uh, a couple of places had, had condensate flows as well, but generally we have to rely on the, uh, the steam rate measurement. And I guess looking at the data in terms of the actual HCC values we're getting, they're all, um, well, let's put it this way, believable. And it's probably about, we've got a basis on that. The main thing is anyhow we're looking for is, is dependency of these variables. So uh, I just want to put this, this example here. Um, it's actually, this is for a brand new 210 ton pan. Uh, it does high grade seed and A or B masquerade. So this one here is an A masquerade. Uh, it wasn't a particularly good vacuum at the time of the test, but minus 84. Uh, steam rate was what we'd say is typical. That's pretty well where we would expect to run an A pan, 0.22 ton an hour per cubic meter which in this case corresponds to 31 tonne an hour. Um, and uh, as we'll see, the connectivity wasn't ramped. So I just want to go through this one here. And obviously you're all very familiar with this types of trends, but just to show you some of the, well, good information we're able to get and also some of the, um, I guess, challenges it does present to us. So um, first of all, a bit of a look down the bottom, We've got some scaling on some of our factors. So our masquerade height in meters is multiplied by 0.1. Our HCC is multiplied by 0.1. And our balance water is multiplied by 10. Just so we can look at some of the numbers. So um, this is our vacuum, steady all the way through. Uh, steam rate, which I just lost my mouse. Steam rate's the next one up. Again, you'll see it's steady all the way through, 31 tonne an hour, until there's a decline there during the heavy up. Uh, balanced water, none at first, a bit, a bit on as it's been cut out, and then none, at, none for the first part of the, uh, the run-up on A mass, and then balanced water was on right through the pan full, and then obviously the pan, as you can see up here, is level. It's in a bit of an idle mode up here for well, nearly an hour in this case. So balanced water is coming on here. Um, this is our HTC value, so starting off around 650, 700, and then declining, holding fairly steady there, then, then declining as, during the heavy up. Um, Masquerade level, so running up to 150 tonne before cutting out, and then running up to 210 tonne. And this is our height above the Calandria. It drops at about, or well, goes to pan fall at about 1650 mil, millimetres, this one. But anyway, I guess we're really important looking at a few things. Calandria pressure, this is the red one. Um, it really holds quite low there until we get up to about 1.1 meters. And then it does start to rise. Obviously we're holding through the, uh, the idle part of the pan full, and then obviously heavy up, it takes up a bit. Um, but anyway, quite low calandria pressure there, which is obviously very pleasing from our point of view. See, it was a pan that we were involved with the design. Um, Ball on rate, 
you can see for the high grade seed quite fast and also for the quite fast for the early stage of the A mascot. And in both those times, there was no balance water. But when we brought on the balance water, obviously the boiling rate slowed. And it does have a bit of influence on HTC through here. I guess the other interesting thing, we've seen this many times, um, for the same steam rate, once we come onto A molasses feed, a substantially increased um, boil on rate in terms of tons, in terms of millimetres boil on on the um, on above the cleanery level. And I guess this is purely because of the increased bricks of the A molasses. So this is a pretty good example to actually demonstrate a lot of effects that are tied up in this these sort of analyses. And what we have to try and get our mind around is is okay, how do we analyze this for HTC where we've got a, a period here where really level isn't having much effect at all on the calendar pressure or the HTC. But then it does have an effect in this particular pan and obviously it does in the, in the heavy up phase. Uh, likewise, we've got variations in boron rates, etc. So there's quite a bit of complexity in actually analyzing the HTC and getting a reliable correlation to cover all situations and Pans are boiled differently. Well, I guess um, if you really thought about this pan, if you, you had 100 kPa absolute vapor, this is indicating here we could actually run up to um, to about just over a metre in height before we would experience a drop off in steam rate. Steam rates start to come down. And what we're going to work out at this project is how far it would come down and how far it would actually affect your boil on rate, your cycle time, etc. But one thing to be certain about is that this rather generous time at pan full, which is an hour, these boil on rates will be much flatter and our available for the limited time here, the time limit at the end will be uh, substantially reduced, which is not a bad thing if there's enough room and you can manage it within your, within your supervision of the stage. So it's, as you can see, there's a lot of good information in this sort of work and this sort of plots to help us in this project. But now we've got to try and bring it all together. Um, I won't spend too much time on this because it just really summarises the data we had last year. Um, but it gives us a little bit of information. So a magma pan, unstirred, 60 tonne pan. Um, a mascot, this is a 210 ton pan, and also a B mascot in that same pan, 210 ton, and a CC pan, 60 ton pan, which was stirred. And I guess HCCs, looking from footing to full, this is before heavy up, in this range here, quite high. A mascot, slightly lower, and B, not much lower. Um, lower, obviously, around pan full, but not much lower as you'd expect the start of the, uh, the B-stripe. CC is substantially lower, and we all know that when we bring in our blend, it doesn't really transfer heat all that well. We're sort of seeing that in these lower HTCs. So we've worked out numbers such as HTC per meter of increase in level, how that must have changes. Um, Calandria pressure, you can see here, but actually the magma pan was a bit higher than we had expected. It goes up to 160. But here's our A and our B, both really only running out to about 135, quite low. Um, when it's up to pan full before heavy up, and the CC is a higher level. But as you can see, if we're trying to use vapor three, and say that was at 97 um, or 90 kPa, we're okay for the first part, but we're running into trouble for that final run up. And here's our calendar pressures that drop. So around 160, 170. Again, this particular uh, factory, this is all from one factory, this data, uh, they run about um, 180 kPa vapor supply to that pan stage. So we're slightly lower than the mains at, uh, for each of these cases. So um, what we need to do is say, okay, well, what have we learned from this in terms of what are the limitations on our current pans in terms of 
ability to handle certain pressures of vapour. And uh, I say here, currently favoured pan, batch pan design. So this is a design where it's been going into the industry now for the last uh, few years, and there's quite a few going into some factories. Um, it, it looks like it can run up to pan full on vapour too. Uh, so this is say for a factory that might have LP at 250, okay. And uh, vapour two would probably be around so say it was 45 kPa drop on each of those effects, so it would be about 160. So as you can see from our previous data, we could, we could run for vapour 2 right up to pan full. We could possibly even do a heavy up if we had more time available to us. And maybe there is more time if we look at the, look at the idle time available. But you could swing over to vapour 1 if you went to the expense of having the, the option of vapour 2 and vapour 1 on the stage. So, these pans are showing that ability, but can we get to vapor three? Well, not on the batch pans currently. For our horizontal CVPs, and we reported this last year, um, they're okay to vapor two, and even possibly vapor three, so 100 degrees C, because for quite a lot of their uh, operating period, they're below atmospheric. But really, that would would require and do require jiggers, a uh, good vacuum, as we see, vacuum has a, a beneficial effect and supply them with preheated feed. So we get a small amount of flash as the feed comes in. And that will obviously help the circulation and help uh, everything maintain good operation. If we want to get down to 90 kPa, our current thinking is really, um, we'll probably have to go to a stirred arrangement in a pan, you see in a continuous pan, and that more than likely will be vertical until we come up with some other fancy way to do it in horizontals economically. Whereas, as you're probably aware, there's quite a bit of interest in verticals, particularly in India. Quite a number of these are going in. Um, so, I'll move on to the next slide. So, a little bit of the sensitivity that we determine from changing uh, headspace pressure and steam rates. And this is going to be important in our analysis going forward, particularly when we get the dynamic modeling using SysCAD. Um, for a 5 kPa increase in headspace pressure in an A-pan, we found that the, this is a pan full, I stress that, this is a pan full condition before, before heavy up, our planetary pressure increased 30 kPa, so really quite substantial. We're only able to change our, our B-mass by 2 kPa, but that was 10 kPa, so it's similar magnitude. So anyway, I was telling you, so when we are looking at going to vapor three, the importance of having a good vacuum, which obviously can be a challenge when we get to uh, high temperature injection water. So the important factor coming out there. For steam rate, um, for an A-pan, reducing it from 0.3 to 0.2 ton per hour per cubic meter, so a fairly large reduction, we did see an a decrease in our um, planetary pressure of 12 kPa. So as you'd expect, reduce the steam, your planetary pressure will come down. And that gives us an idea of how much that's going to interfere with our, um, or our ability to reduce our, our planetary pressure below our, our target as we reduce our steam flow. For a B, um, there's actually a stronger effect. Only going from 0.22 down to 0.17, which that's what we're able to do came down by 10 kPa. So both those factors have to be taken into account. And we'll also take into account some information we got on uh, stirrer speed. Well, I'm just stepping back from the whole, whole uh, sham, considering what, what's really striking us here in our, uh, in our results so far, and how, how can we reduce the factory steam consumption through changes on the pan stage? And there's two aspects to it. One is obviously using lower pressure vapor. So go for vapor three instead of vapor two or vapor one. That gives us our efficiencies through uh, the Rulio principle. And the other one is obviously use less steam. So um, a couple of obvious things coming out. With lower pressure vapor, we'll have a lower steam rate. Lower ball on rate, we'll have less idle time. So 
So what that will probably mean for the factory is much more pressure on the supervision side of it. And um, it may mean we have to revisit. I think it probably will mean we have to revisit at some stage, supervisory control of the pan stage, because we are going to be running, we're going to be taking as much productivity out of our pans as we can and minimizing our, our uh, buffer capacity that we have up there. We found that so many of the pans we investigated, and this surprised me quite a bit, uh, we're using a lot of balance water. Now, I'm, I'm not convinced it means it's because, there's, um, because the pans aren't circulating all that well. I think maybe just a, a safe way of operating and maybe, maybe quite happily getting rid of the gas in some cases, uh, quite a few place, places maybe. But anyhow, it means that if there is a circulation issue, then there's a couple of options for us. Stirrers and jiggers can be retrofitted and also using preheated feed would also help the, the movement of the pan. Um, we came across a few places where pans were given a routine fine grain wash. And it was routine and the, and the operator would just hit the button at, at um, this level and even in some places do it twice through a run up. And uh, I remember saying to him, I went and I was proofing it, saying, oh, doesn't look all that bad to me. He said, oh, we'll, we'll get a ma better mascot when we drop it. And no doubt he did too, but, um, but it just probably means there's probably a little bit more could be done on our bricks control for those pans at least. Um, and it would also be helped obviously with better circulation from jiggers or stirrers, etc. cetera. Um, we we're running our, our schedules pretty rigidly so obviously all our high grades for many factories are running to a very tight schedule. And obviously that's a, uh, that places more restriction on us when we're running with low pressure vapor and we've got less, uh, less buffer capacity. Then the use of a high grade seed is obviously going to, seed receiver is obviously going to be a, uh, provide relaxation to that whole system. So that may be a, an option that's very, very useful. Another one is, where possible, reducing our non-productive time. I'd say all our factories have got pretty good tight turnaround times, um, but there's probably still room, looking carefully, particularly with replacement pans, where we may be able to get um, uh, transfers, cutouts done on the run. And that obviously is quite a saving, rather than having to drop back in and re-raise it, etc. So that's the first one we we're using, low pressure vapour. Uh, the second one is basically where we actually aim to reduce our steam consumption. Um, as I said, many of the pans are running with balanced water, and quite a bit in, in some places. Um, so it may be that the solution there is we can cut the balanced water out. Maybe we might have to invest a little bit into uh, improving the circulation through preheated feed or jiggers or whatever. Um, and it may be that control also will, uh, will assist. One thing that obviously we're still lacking uh, in the sugar industry in general is a measure of sip saturation. We're still using connectivity and using it very effectively, um, but I think there's considerable gains we can make if we had a reliable measure of sip saturation. So it's something, something not working on, but something that's certainly um, getting more and more in the front of mind as to something we, we should be looking at down the track. Um, just a general statement, we, we did, did experience situations where uh, pans were using quite a lot of injection water and this obviously occurred mainly when the injection water was hot and later in the season and uh, there was complaints going on that you know, other pans were being starved etc and we played around with one particular pan and found that, that we could cut the, uh, the, um, vacuum, the injection water valve back from 80% open to 35% uh, open and we suffered a 0.2 kPa drop in vacuum. Um, that just, just reinforces that we'll probably do better control around our pan stages, pan, pan condensers, by using torrid leak temperature in the control system. And it may be something that um, would make considerable savings um, for factories experiencing that's, that, uh, that situation. So, um, probably only acknowledgement, just 
just to tell you where we're up to, um, what we were hoping very much to have our HTC correlation available to talk to you about today, um, but obviously it's not the case. Um, it's become obvious to us that we're going to have to split split our sections. Um, obviously, heavy up's going to be separate from the run up, and we may have to have a few other little uh, variations in there as well. Um, but mainly because of the information you saw when I went through that example it does show quite a bit of, um, I guess, confounding of, of data depending on different situations. But anyhow, when we um, when we get this completed. Uh, what our plan is is to uh, to write this up, um, be a fair sized document I can warn you, uh, and give you the HTC correlations and, and describe these things in more detail, what we found. Because um, we'll do that and send it out to the mills because our next milestone with SRA isn't due till um, February next year. So we don't want to wait till then. But it'll probably take us a couple more months to get to that, that point as we saw through this uh, some of these difficulties. But as I say, got good data. We're uh, really uh, pleased about that. And uh, I do acknowledge the, the support we've got from all these mills, McNade, Tully, Calamia, Invicta, Isis, Eagerman, and Pioneer. Every mill was very, very helpful to us. Understanding, of course. Uh, and it worked out very well. I had a, a mate with me, Michael Bongard, he's uh, from our group. He, uh, he assisted me in the factory trials and also which lumbered with all the laboratory analyses. So I thank you very much for that. And uh, SRA, I'd like to thank them. They funded the project. So thank you for your time and I look forward to any questions. Okay, Ross, it's, uh, we might just wait a minute or so to see if any questions field into the Q&A. Um, please feel free to enter them into chat or Q&A or alternatively put your hand up and I can unmute your microphone. Okay, so we don't have any questions in there at the moment, Ross, so we okay. might keep moving along. Um, feel free to enter those in um, as you think of them and we can come back to them at the end. Um, so I'll um, ask uh, Iman to get his slides up now. Thank you. Yeah. And our second uh, presenter for today is Iman. So I'll hand it over to you now. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Sam. Uh, and also thank you, Ross, for the introduction. And thank you for all the attendees for attending this webinar. Uh, so, as Sam mentioned, this webinar um, discussed the result of the small milling project that uh, was funded by SRA to investigate the performance of the SRA design uh, fixed element cooling crystallizer at Broadwater. And uh, this is not the first installation of this design in, in Australia. So, the first one has been installed in 2012 in Victoria Mill but as more data was needed to investigate the performance of such design, this project was funded. And in this project, Ross, myself from QUT and Michelle and Greg uh, were the main people who uh, did the project. Uh, okay, so here uh, we have the specification of the continuous crystallizer at Broadwater Mill. It is uh, made up of three horizontal crystallizers each are at 45 ton capacity, and the unit operates in series uh, flow. And um, also um, for the uh, uh, pipe uh, to be used for the cooling elements, um, one, of the, uh, one of the important parameters uh, is the cooling surface, and this parameter uh, is indicated by the area to volume ratio for uh, fixed element crystallizer at Broadwater, this number is point, uh, 2.1, uh, which is a little bit more than uh, same size crystallizer, uh, which has coil um, design. And uh, also in this crystallizer, uh, a variable speed drive was installed on the unit to allow the rotational speed of the paddle. 
uh, and it's capable capable of uh, running the paddle from 0.5 RPM to 1.45 uh, RPM, depending on the mass width viscosity. I was saying the um, uh, the motor that is installed on this uh, that was installed on this crystallizer uh, is a 9.2 kilowatt motor, and it is installed on the existing uh, warm drive. And um, the other uh, uh, important specification of this uh, crystallizer uh, and the main improvement in this cooling element uh, at Broadwater compared to the one that was installed uh, in Victoria Mill is uh, the 180 degree uh, return that uh, were uh, produced by bending the pipe rather than modifying and welding the commercial 90 degree pipes. And that change uh, reduced the number of welds uh, to about a third uh, of what uh, uh, used in uh, Victoria Mill. Um, here uh, we have the uh, schematic of this crystallizer. And as you can see, it consists of 12 fixed cooling elements and 14 rotating paddles. And also in the middle, we have a baffle and the baffle reduced the likelihood of short uh, circuiting of the mask width. Also, as you can see, we have a few probes, temperature probes uh, along the crystallizer to measure the water inlet and outlet and also the mask width inlet and outlet temperature. Um, also, paddles are, uh, we have two paddles at both ends, end, ends of the crystallizer. Uh, so this arrangement reduces the chance of stagnant mass width exiting these regions. And I'm going to back to uh, this point later when I'm talking about the uh, residence time. And uh, also the cooling water supply to this crystallizer is in a closed circuit system. And the temperature of cooling water for this crystallizer is consistent throughout the season and it's about 30 degrees C. Uh, also, the water flow rate uh, to the cooling element is measured uh, via a magnetic flow meter and uh, the flow rate is between 5 to 8 ton per hour based on the required temperature of mass width at the outlet. Um, so, uh, the main objectives of this project were investigating of a few things. Uh, so, the first one was uh, the HTC and there uh, we, did a, we did the trials for a range of rotational speeds of the paddle, inlet mass width composition, and also cooling water flow rate. And the investigations allowed us to calculate the uh, heat transfer coefficient at the cooling elements and also the loss of heat from the mass width uh, to the atmosphere. Uh, we used the factory DCS data to select uh, periods of longer than five hours. Um, when the water uh, flow rate and uh, other processing conditions such as torque were reasonably steady to calculate the HTC. And uh, also um, we uh, looked into the power number which is a dimensionless number and that can be used to estimate the fluid uh, power demand for the crystallizer. Uh, next, uh, to measure the mass with exhaustion, we took mass width samples at the entry to number one crystallizer and at the exit of number one crystallizer at different times throughout the season. And then uh, we used the pressure filter to um, separate the mother molasses from the mass width. And we analyzed the mass width and mother, mother of molasses for succrus by mean of double pole and dry substance. And for that we used a vacuum oven, vacuum oven drawing uh, technique. Uh, next, uh, we uh, measured the residence time at two different rotational speeds uh, of the paddles. And also uh, two series of lithium tracer tests were undertaken to determine the residence time of, um, of the mass width flow through number one crystallizer. The first test uh, has been done on 15th of October and the next one uh, was done two days after on 17th. Uh, I will talk about all these later more in detail. And the last uh, objective of this project is a financial analysis that I'm going to talk about it uh, later. So um, this is the um, 
first uh, part of the results, uh, heat transfer. And as I mentioned earlier, we analyzed the log data collected under steady operation conditions to provide heat flux to the cooling water stream and from the mass grid for a range of processing conditions. And in this figure, uh, we can see the calculated HTC at the surface of the cooling elements based on the heat flux transferred to the water. And uh, because of the limited amount of data in this figure, um, the, the reason we have this limited number of data in this figure is the lack of steady conditions available for the required period of several hours um, in the log DCS data. And uh, the other thing here, as you can see, is uh, having lots of data at this region. And that's because for most of the season, the crystallizer was operated at a fast rotational speed uh, to get a high um, shear. And it was only during the test period that uh, a low speed uh, was used. And um, the HTC data in this figure show a linear correlation between the rotational speed uh, of the paddles and the HTC value. HTC value uh, increase by, increases by 20% when rotational speed, speed is doubled. And um, this dependency on rotational speed is similar to what has been reported before in the literature uh, for the uh, coil design at number one crystallizer. Also, the calculated HTC value uh, range between 25 to uh, 25 watts per square meter per Kelvin at 0.5 uh, RPM. And uh, this value increases to 32 to 36 watts per square meter per Kelvin when the RPM increases to 1.45 RPM. And the larger values for high rotational speed are similar to the report uh, uh, back in 2014 from the Victoria Mill for the fixed uh, element crystallizer. Uh, however, in that, um, uh, that meal, the uh, rotational speed of the paddle uh, was reported 0.8 to 1.2 RPM. Also in that report, there's a summary of HTC values for several coil type crystallizers and the value um, of HTC for those crystallizers were ranged between 20 to 30 uh, watt per cubic, uh, per square meter per Kelvin. And based on these, these uh, results, um, we can see that the data for the fixed element crystallizer at both Victoria and Broadwater Mill um, show mass grid cooling rate um, is comparable or even faster than the rotating cool, uh, coil uh, design. Um, the other thing that we noticed when we analyzed this data was we found that uh, the mass width viscosity is higher. Uh, when the mass width viscosity is higher, the value of HTC is slightly lower. Um, next, we move to uh, analyzing the power consumption and um, um, as I mentioned, the fluid power demand of the crystallizer can be characterized by the viscous power number and that number can be calculated using this equation. In this equation, P represents power consumption in watt, mu is the mass width viscosity in uh, Pascal second, N is the uh, rotational speed in RPM, um, and uh, also um, uh, L is uh, the uh, crystallizer's width. And during the test periods, the motor current for the crystallizer drive, um, crystallizer drive varied uh, between 9 to 16 amp. And those were corresponding to a uh, power draw of 3.7 to 6.6 .6 kilowatt. Uh, assuming the uh, power factor is equal to one. And for this study, the data for the consumed fluid power were not available to us. So what we did was using the consumed power for the drive value. And based on the consumed power, the range of uh, VP number is between 1000 to 2000. Um, next, um, we uh, checked on the mass grid uh, exhaustion. 
So the mask width through pu uh, purity for the continuous time was typically uh, between 64 to 65. And the ion W value were more than 4.5, which is considered to be a um, high level ion W. And also the measured purity drop in the C mask width in the pan discharge uh, was on average 17.9. Uh, that indicate a high level of exhaustion. Uh, also, the average consistency of the pan discharge was uh, 265 uh, pascal second, and that can be considered a heavy mass weight by the industry standards. Uh, also, the purity drop in the mother molasses in number one crystallizer was on average 4.7 units and this level of exhaustion is substantially larger for, for the residence time of this unit, which is around four hours, uh, especially for the CMAS grid at 64 to 65 uh, true purity. And the purity drop in number one crystallizer uh, is about two thirds of the purity drop across the whole um, unit, um, the crystallizer set. Also in the analysis, it was observed that for uh, mass widths of higher ion W, uh, let's say more than 4.4, the purity of the mother molasses existing number one crystallizer was a little bit lower. And the other observation here was um, based on two trials that we've done. The, uh, the reheater uh, didn't dissolve the crystals, but it adds a small amount of crystallization to the mass grid. Um, also calculation of the supersaturation of the mother molasses at exit of number one crystallizer showed that uh, to maintain sufficiently high supersaturation, uh, driving force to continue crystallization process in the next crystallizer, the cooling rate should be in the range of uh, this table. And uh, here, um, as a guideline, based on what INW we have, we can see uh, what cooling rate uh, should be uh, reached to uh, to maintain the supersaturation. And this recommended cooling rates is generally I agree with the industry guideline for uh, maximizing the exhaustion. So for 3.8 INW, it should be higher than 3. 4 to 4.4, 4, it should be more than 2.5, and for INW more than 5.1, it should be around 1.5 to 2 degrees C per hour. Um, next, uh, we have the residence time distribution, and in this plot, uh, we can see the result for the residence time distribution for the two different tests that uh, I talked about earlier. In test one uh, or test A, uh, the mass width flow rate is at 12 ton per hour uh, and the rotational speed of the paddle set at 1.25 RPM. Uh, for test B, uh, the mass width flow dropped to 10 ton per hour and uh, the rotational speed uh, was set at uh, 0.5 RPM. The intention was to undertake both tests at the same mass width rate. Uh, and just change the rotational speed, but reduce crushing rate for test B restricted us um, and uh, the production rate at that time dropped to 10 ton per hour. So for these um, given numbers, so for test A, the residence time uh, was calculated to be 3.75 hour. And for the second one, uh, the residence time was 4.5 hour. Here in this plot, as we can see, uh, we have a narrower spread of residence time achieved for the higher rotational speed. Uh, so uh, for the uh, test A, and it looks that for test B, some mass grid traveled uh, to the outlet slightly faster, as we can see here. Uh, and um, even though the mass grid inflow rate was slower, and the reason could be due to this lower rotational speed for test B that allowed some mass width to travel longitudinally faster than um, test A. So when we look into the first section of, 
this plot. There is no evidence of short circuiting uh, flow of the mass fluid across the crystallizer at both rotational speeds. So there's no uh, blimp here. But when we are looking at the uh, tail section of this plot, we can see a few blimps uh, for both cases. And um, this can represent the mass width being held aside from the main flow. And most likely this material traveled into the section upstream of the mass width entry and then gradually moved out from this region over time and traveled back into the main flow stream of mass width. And this is uh, what I mentioned earlier when I showed the sketch of the crystallizer. Um, so uh, next we modeled the performance of the crystallizer and we did a comparison between the actual exhaustion performance of this crystallizer with the expected performance as predicted by the SRI model of cooling crystallization. So for the modeling, a key parameter that needs to be determined is the effective shear rate and that is applied to the mass weight and is mainly a function of rotational speed of the paddles. Uh, for coi crystallizer, the shear rate is usually in order of uh, 0.04 uh, port of second at a coil rotational uh, speed of 0.5 uh, RPM. And we use the same shear rate relationship to model the performance of the fixed element crystallizer. And the model was drawn for different set of process uh, co conditions. And in all the cases, the actual purity drop in number one crystallizer exceeded the predicted purity drop with the average additional purity drop being 1.7 units. And that is about 35% greater. Uh, um, so we know that the effective shear rate in the fixed element crystallizer is substantially greater than the shear rate generated in a coil design uh, at the same rotational speed. And visually the crystallizer provides a strong uh, sh uh, shearing action on the mass width. And as you can see here in this photo, unfortunately I couldn't provide you the, um, the video that we took on site, but even at this photo, we can see how good is the shear uh, in a fixed uh, cooling crystallizer uh, when we compare it to um, coil uh, crystallizer. Uh, so um, also the shear rate dependency in the growth rate expression of the SRI model may not sufficiently strong to account for the additional exhaustion. And uh, we think this uh, may indicate uh, deficiency in the model for higher shear rate condition and uh, under prediction of the um, uh, performance by the model could uh, be a result of uh, this. Next, uh, we did the cost to benefit analysis and uh, the cost of the cost to refurbish a crystallizer of 70 cubic meter, which is a common size in the industry, is estimated to be uh, about 350 grand in 2020. Uh, and the refurbishment of the same size coil crystallizer uh, is about uh, half a million and uh, it could be possibly more. Uh, hence the cost of refurbishment of a crystallizer using fixed element uh, is about 30% less than the coil. And also based on the cost of the refurbishment and also uh, the uh, strong performance results that we've already discussed. The use of fixed element uh, crystallizer design appears to be uh, a financially attractive solution for refurbishing the horizontal crystallizers in several Australian um, factories. And also to give you a few advantages of this type of design. So here we don't need any rotary seals. Uh, there is less stress on the cooling elements and also it's really easy to isolate a couple of elements by, by passing them. But there are a few disadvantages as well. So one of them is accessing the lower sections of the crystallizer is not easy and um, th there's a possibility that uh, the whole crystallizer needs to be emptied to have access to that area. 
and also there's a need to have the um, vent for the air in the cooling water because if you don't have the vent, the bubbles inside the uh, pipe could uh, increase um, the pressure drop on the pump and stop the water circulation. Um, also, we have a few recommendations when using this type of crystallizer. Uh, first one is torque control of the VSD is preferable as this ensures the paddles are rotating at maximum speed and that gives a better shear on the mask weight and at the same time we are protecting the crystallizer's drive equipment. Uh, the second one is using closed recirculating water system uh, which is favorable for all cooling crystallizer systems. And the third one is um, uh, for, the, for all designs of cooling crystallizers, the control of temperature of the mask width for regulating the cooling water flow rate is difficult as a result of slow response of the measured uh, mask width temperature. And ideally, uh, the mask width temperature at the exit of the crystallizer would be controlled to, be set, to, to a set point. And, um, to ensure that mass width viscosity is consistent. Um, so that was it and I just want to uh, thank the management and engineers and uh, production staff at Broadwater Mill, specifically Michelle and Greg, uh, the laboratory staff at QUT, specifically Tal, um, Michael and Darcy, and also SRA for uh, giving us the opportunity to work on this project. And uh, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Iman. We do have um, a question here from Philip Scrope for you. Yep. Can, can you explain how the IW numbers were calculated? True purity and dry substance. I hope I've said that correctly. Do you want me to answer that one, Iman? Uh, you can go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so for the true purity and dry substance, the, uh, so the, the top line impurity is calculated as being uh, 100 minus the purity times dry substance, and the bottom line is 100 minus dry substance. So that gives you the values then of, typically if you use um, sucrose by double pole and, and dry substance by vacuum oven drying, um, we would be aiming for mass widths of say four, 0 0.0, INW up to say maybe 4.3, 4.4. Um, if you are using HPLC and uh, air oven, atmospheric oven, the values would be lower for the same mass wood by about 0.4 or 0.5 of a unit. So um, yeah, so if we were getting if we were getting 4.2, you'd be looking at about 3.8 or 3.7 if you're using the air oven drying. That value there on the screen of 5.1, uh, that's our highest one we had in this test, which is very high. Um, that is very high for a CMAS. Um, it, it did give the best performance in terms of the lowest purity of the molasses. But as you can see from that, you don't cool too fast. Otherwise your viscosity gets too high. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks Ross. Uh, feel free to send any more questions through to either the chat or the Q&A. We'll just wait a, an, another little while to see if any more flow in. Um, in the meantime, I might just do my, my wrap up and if any questions come in, we'll go back to them. Maybe I might just add one, one more piece. Yes, no worries. Um, the, we were really pleased with the resonance time distribution. Um, I guess we were pleased, first of all, to see it come back to zero, which, was, which is always good to know. Um, we, we did the test for long enough, about 15 hours to, uh, to cover that period. But um, yeah, the CV, I think there's two main things coming out of it. First of all, the CV on test A, which is the higher speed one of 0.4, is really pretty narrow for uh, for crystallizers, and there's, we've got a note down the bottom there. Years ago, we did some trials on a station that comprised six coil crystallizers in series, and we got a CV of 0.4 for that that whole station of six crystallizers. 
And here we're getting it here, and one crystallizer only, 0.4. Um, and even 0.58 test B is, is uh, as good as some of the other data that's been obtained or other uh, poor crystallizer data for a whole set. And the other, the other thing is the fact that test A has got that lower CV than test B. And uh, yeah, I just want to emphasize that running at the highest speed, we believe is giving you a strong transverse push to the mascot. And that obviously limits the uh, speed at which it travels to the far end, makes you do a few more cycles, if you like, transversely. And I think that's why we get a narrower CV with that uh, higher speed. So it's, it's a good, um, good way to operate a number one and possibly number two crystallizer in a series. Higher speed gives you a narrow resonance time distribution, but importantly, as Aman showed, we we're also getting the benefit of, um, of high shear giving us good exhaustion. So uh, yeah, variable speed drives on number one and number two in a series. Um, dividends. Ross, we have a comment uh, from Jay Venning. I think the residence time is better than the VRA set achieved. What's the main difference? Um, well, from the VRA one, from memory, um, it was quite a difficult, difficult um, vessel to actually add the lithium. From memory, we had to pour it into like a chute that was coming in. And we did have some concerns there that it was that it wasn't being mixed uh, mixed in straight away when it came in. So there was a appeared to be a bit of a dead zone, I think, just the way the entry was at um, Victoria. Um, this one here has a little bit of a problem too because if you um, want to go back to the slide, Amon. Yep. So. If you look at that, Amon, you might like to show it where the the entry here on this chute. Um, at the bottom there is coming in around paddle two. Ideally, and it's not, not all that easy to arrange, obviously, in practice, but ideally it would have been coming in at paddle one because we think some of the material here even would, would have hung up around that first area around paddle one before it managed to get itself out and get flowing. Uh, but yeah, I think the Victoria one really was um, very much more difficult to get the material in and well mixed right from the beginning. Okay, um, thanks Ross. There's no other questions at the moment. So I might just talk about our um, upcoming webinars and we can go back to any Q&A if they get typed in the meantime. So thank you all for attending our third SRA Milling Regional Research Seminar. We hope that you found it of value and are keen to get feedback from you. After this session, you will receive a link to a survey that we'd like you to complete. It will only take a few minutes of your time and it will allow us to improve our webinars in the future. Tomorrow, you will receive an email with a recording from today and the slides. Our next Milling Regional Research Seminar will be held on 30 April and will be presented by Dr. Ian O'Hara, who will present on biorefineries for profit, phase two, he will also present on integration of biogas from sugarcane residues in sugarcane transport and milling to reduce fossil fuel usage. We've just got another question coming to Q&A from Jay. Question is, who formed the elements? Um, well, I formed in Brisbane. Well, they were contracted to a company in Brisbane. Uh, I think they, I think they were actually formed in Southeast Queensland. Let's put it that way. As far as, I don't, don't particularly know the exact answer, and um, but they were certainly done locally. Let's put it that way. Lo locally being Queensland, Australia, if you like, they weren't done overseas. Um, although I will say, when we when we started dealing with this with Victoria, um, we did advance of the situation with the company in Melbourne, is well known to you for boiler, boiler tubes. Um, and they, were, they, they had a fairly, a very competitive price. Uh, but as it turned out, they had a long delivery time and that was coming from India. Um, but in the end, they were supplied locally. So that was, uh, and, and a good price.
Excellent. Thanks, I'm Ross. Jay, I'm certain Jay uh, Rob would be happy to give you the any more details I've got. Okay. Um, so we don't have any other questions in our Q and A box at the moment. So I just want to remind you all that you can go onto the SRA website to see uh, any information about the upcoming uh, regional research seminar topics and the links to register for any of those. Um, so if there's no more questions, I'd like to thank you all for coming along today and hope to see you at our next webinar. Thank you to our presenters as well. Thanks, Ross. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, Samantha. Yes.